And I'm really glad about tonight's, uh, tonight's lesson for us in the, in the auditorium because uh, I don't think we probably spent as much time getting to know the two characters that we'll be discussing this evening. Tonight we're going to be talking about Aquila and Priscilla. And I know for me, uh, these, uh, this was a story that I knew of, but I probably didn't spend too much time actually getting to know and getting to know these people and, and what they did for the church and what they did for Paul uh, on his, uh, uh, during his missions. And the lesson that we're going to learn about Aquila and Priscilla has to do with their service. We're going to learn about what the service is that we're required as Christians and what doing service for the Lord requires of us. Um, what we've learned from Aquila and Priscilla, uh, probably above anything else, is the fact that they were available. Uh, there's a, we, we pray, I think, often, you know, God, give me an opportunity, you know, uh, help bring somebody into my life that I might show them the way. Give me an opportunity to be an evangelist uh, like you want me to be. I, I hope that we pray that often, and I hope that we're being sincere about it. But there's a difference between praying that God asks you to do something and making sure that you are able to accept when that opportunity comes around. And Aquila and Priscilla really demonstrate this for us, that they were available. When the, when the time came for God to call on them to, to his work, they were available. They could do something. They didn't have a Im more important task in their life that they could have chosen to do instead. When the, when the time came, they were available. And our question that we're going to ask of ourselves tonight is, am I available? Are you available? When we read this story, uh, or these stories uh, recorded in the New Testament about uh, what Aquila and Priscilla did, the amount of dedication that they had, do I measure up to that? Now, not, not every one of us is going to have the ability to, uh, to go and drop uh, an entire career and, uh, and leave, leave them in the, in the past, if you will, and, and hope that everything uh, gets taken care of. Uh, but aren't there things that we can put aside and, and make sure that in our walk with the Lord, in, in our lives, we make sure that when the call does come, we make sure that it's a priority. Because we are commanded to be available. We're, we're commanded to, uh, to have this mind, uh, a desire in our hearts to do things for, uh, for the Lord. And we're going we're gonna to study three important characteristics of making ourselves available uh, to the Lord and how we can do that in our lives. Uh, so let's, let's get into the, the, uh, the lesson here. Let's get into the story of Aquila and Priscilla. And we're going to be starting in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18 uh, in verses 1 and 2. And we're going to meet Aquila and his wife, Priscilla. And this is going to happen during Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, so we are still talking about a, a pretty early on in the church. Remember that, uh, remember that the church started about 33 AD. And so we, are, uh, uh, we have come around, the, uh, the gospel has begun being spread, uh, and now we are at approximately somewhere around 49 AD, somewhere in, around that time. And the, the scripture tells us after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. And that's Acts chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. So the first thing we're going to see is that uh, Aquila and Priscilla, they, uh, they have already made the journey from Rome to Corinth. And all we, though we don't know exactly how uh, Aquila and Priscilla uh, obey, obeyed the gospel, uh, we can assume that uh, either they heard it from another preacher uh, up, uh, prior to their meeting with Paul, or Paul uh, preached to them himself. Uh, but we are not, we, we don't have any, uh, we're just not given that information in the text of whether or not they, uh, you know, how they were converted. But what we do see here is that Paul gave them an opportunity to serve. So I want us to take a look at the journey that Aquila and Priscilla are making. And remember, the first thing they do is they move from Rome to Corinth. And that's already, as it is, a pretty, pretty, pretty 
good hike. You know, they're going to, uh, we don't know whether or not they went by land or by water, uh, but, they, uh, but they go and make that journey, and, uh, and it, uh, it seems that it wasn't by their choice. They go to Corinth because of the expulsion uh, that, the, uh, uh, that Claudius uh, had uh, enacted. And so they meet Paul, and, and they find that they have something in common with Paul. Acts chapter 18, verse 3, it tells us that so because he, Paul, was of the same trade as them, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. So back in Rome, what did Aquila and Priscilla do for a living? But they, they made tents. They made uh, places where you could uh, live or places where you could sell and trade. Uh, uh, that was their occupation. And they, and they had to pick up and leave from this uh, uh, from this occupation, and, and seems like they just started off where they started where they left off in Corinth, uh, restarting that business and getting into work uh, and back into that work. And and Paul, who had experience in this, uh, joined them in that. And I think it's it's worth pausing here to acknowledge that it wasn't just because they were of the same trade that Paul uh, stayed with them, but obviously they shared the same love for the gospel that Paul had. And we see that in how long they stayed with them. A year and a half later, they're still working with Paul. Paul is still with them uh, up until this point. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 18, verse 11, that Paul stayed at Corinth for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So were Aquila and Priscilla simply uh, hanging out with Paul because he because he was a tent maker or because uh, of, his, of his work. And it seems apparent it's because of his work. And then following that, uh, uh, Aquila and Pri uh, Priscilla uh, s then sail with Paul on, his, on the next leg of his journey. So Paul still remained, the, remained a good while, then he took leave for the, uh, of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. So, uh, so let's take a look at that map again. Let's, let's get an idea of where, uh, where this journey is taking them. Now they're crossing over the Aegean Sea, and there they are in, uh, uh, in Ephesus. Uh, <laughs> these guys are doing a lot of traveling. A lot of traveling, and, and the work is not just for themselves, or it's not for themselves. The work is for the Lord. The work is for, uh, for assisting Paul in his missions. And at this particular juncture... Paul has to leave uh, pretty soon after they get there, and uh, uh, and now uh, now they are in Ephesus, and we'll find I will read later about the different works that they did while in Ephesus. So then, following this, uh, we're going to see another uh, uh, another aspect of of their mission. Uh, the, uh, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19, The churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Priscilla, greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So in ad addition to the, the great traveling that Aquila and Priscilla have done uh, already for the church uh, in assisting Paul in his missions, we found here that what, uh, what else did Aquila and Priscilla do for the Lord? They were holding church services in their very own home. So they, they opened up their business to Paul uh, to work with them. They assisted Paul in his preaching. They traveled with Paul uh, uh, across the sea. And now uh, in Ephesus, or, or sorry, in, at this point, in, uh, they, they then arrive in Corinth uh, uh, at some point. And, uh, and it's obvious, or we're told here that they have opened their houses up for the worship of the early church. Are, are, are Priscilla and Aquila making themselves available for the Lord? Uh, in every aspect, they're making themselves available. Available in, of their time, available of their, uh, of their possessions, available of their living spaces. Uh, in all these different ways, uh, uh, Aquila and Priscilla have made themselves useful to the church. If we skip ahead in our in our Bibles to the Book of Romans, we're going to see that uh, uh, we're going to see uh, that Priscilla and Aquila do eventually move back to Rome, and there we're going to see another great leap 
in distance. And all for the church. And while they're in, in Rome, uh, we're, told, uh, uh, we're told that uh, Paul sends greeting back to them. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. And what is, how does he refer to them? In Romans chapter 16, verses 3 through 5, he says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. So they do their, uh, they do their time in Corinth. They, do, uh, they, they spend some time in Ephesus, and eventually they make their way back to Rome. And what are they still doing but working with the congregations uh, and, and holding worship services in their home? Can anybody tell me what might be difficult about holding worship services in your home in the first century? What's that? It's what? It's hot? <laughs> hot and temperature-wise? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I imagine a lot of people in the home would... would uh, the ACs didn't blow that well back in the first century. But... Um, what other, uh, the temperature, I think, of the people the first century was a little high too, wasn't it? Uh, what's that? Oh, transportation. Getting people to and from would have been very difficult for sure. Getting to and from uh, Ephesus to Rome would have been a very difficult thing. But the very act of holding people in your home for worship, it presented dangers because of the persecution the church was going through. Uh, we're going to see through... Um, uh, uh, when we continue reading here in the book of Acts, you, were, uh, you see how they were being persecuted uh, not just by the Romans. You know, and of course, the Romans had a lot of issues with the first century church because of all the uh, trouble they seemed to be causing, all this, all this rebellion amongst the Jews. They've, uh, they've got somebody else every other week that they want to crucify, apparently. And, uh, but amongst the Jews themselves they are finding great difficulty. When, uh, when Paul uh, travels uh, to Ephesus, his, uh, he's not greeted well, and, uh, and he has to flee. Or sorry, when he goes to uh, Corinth, he's not greeted well by the people there and, and ends up having to flee because the, uh, the Jews would pursue him uh, and, uh, and seek to hurt them. And, and, uh, and we'll, we'll get more into that later. Uh, but... Uh, you'll notice that uh, uh, in Paul's second letter to Timothy, and that's Timothy chapter 4, verse 19, uh, Paul tells Timothy again to greet Priscilla and Aquila. We have a very long period of time here that Aquila and Priscilla are dedicating to the church. By this time, it's about 64, or uh, somewhere between 64 and 68 AD. And, and where do we start? About 49 so we're getting uh, close to 20 years of service uh, that Aquila and Priscilla have put into the church. Not, and not just, you know, sending out greeting cards, which is a very important and good work, not belittling, belittling that whatsoever. But this was very, very deep dedication to the church that was being practiced by Aquila and Priscilla. Literally bringing people into your home that could invite trouble, that could invite persecution by the religious leaders in your area, could bring persecution by the governing body uh, of the time period. It was an act of true bravery uh, and dedication that Aquila and Priscilla exemplify here. Romans 16, verse 3 it, it emphasized there that they were fellow workers in Christ Jesus. It's safe to assume that these decisions that they made to do all these things were not for themselves, but for the sake of the gospel. Why did they go through all these hardships? Why did they endure um, this great responsibility that they took on, uh, all this travel across, across seas? I don't know if you're aware, but traveling across bodies of water back then was not exactly the safest form of travel uh, especially in the uh, in the uh, in the mediterranean in the in the surrounding bodies of water it was not exactly the safest way to get around but they put themselves at risk for the work of the lord so we want to look then at 
what it took for them to be available. What did they do? What did they practice that, uh, that allowed them to be so available, that allowed them to be so create, uh, courageous to make time for the Lord? And the first thing we want to look at here, and we're going to skip a couple slides here. There's a few slides. <laughs> that being available is going to require of us some flexibility. <laughs> it's going to require for us to not be so rigid about our lives. Um, we want to think about things right now that, that might make us seem inflexible. What things uh, keep us from doing things for the, for the church? What kind of things make us not exactly want to shift our schedule around? Uh, I think a symptom of that is maybe sometimes we get too comfortable. Um, one of the most worshipped idols in our country today has got to be comfortability or leisure time. How much time do we spend relaxing? And uh, I'm the first person to, to raise my hand and say I'm guilty. Uh, spent many, many years of my life just trying to take a break. Man, that, the break really shouldn't last that long. <laughs> you got to make yourself available. Uh, the dictionary des defines leisure or leisure in a few ways. Uh, it calls it freedom from the demands of work or duty. Again, some leisure time is, is, not a, is not a bad thing in and of itself. But when the dictionary defines it as freedom from the demands of work or duty, this might be something we want to consider. Uh, are our duties important? By, by definition, they are. They are something that we're required to do. They're, they're something that is integral to, uh, to our purpose. Uh, another definition says time, uh, time free from the demands of work or duty, which one can rest and enjoy hobbies or sports or, or the like. So the, the Bible does not con, uh, condemn uh, taking time to yourself. It doesn't condemn relaxing. Uh, take a look at Matthew chapter 11 really quick. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Is there good to taking rest? Of course. Otherwise, Christ would not offer that to us. Rest, uh, taking time to rest ourselves uh, is not bad. Uh, furthermore, look at Mark chapter 6, verse 31 Mark chapter 6, 31. And he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a desired place and rest a while. So even, even amongst his disciples, he's, uh, we know the stories of how, how Christ would ask people to, uh, uh, to come with him, to, to drop what you're doing, even if you, 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 know, you have the excuse of a, of a funeral to attend or the possibility of a, of a funeral to attend. That's not as important as, as taking time to follow Christ. But even those uh, people, it was good for them to take time to rest. So we're, uh, the point of today's lesson is not to tell us that, uh, that when we you know, kick up the, the, the recliner once in a while and, and throw on you know, a, a TV show that we're, in, that we're sinning. But when that becomes more important than the work that we're expected to do for the Lord then we have a problem. We do not want to be so comfortable that we become lazy. Uh, look at uh, Proverbs chapter 24, verses 33 and 34. Twenty-four, thirty-three, and 34. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler. And you need like an armored man, uh, like an armed man. So is there a point where our addiction to leisure time, our addiction to our hobbies, our addictions to, uh, uh, to sleeping, a little, uh, sleeping in a little too late, 
that it becomes a problem, certainly. And the, the proverb there tells us that it can lead to our ruin. Uh, man, when I was in my early 20s, there was, a, there was a, a time period where I was having a really tough time sleeping, and it was because I wasn't taking care of myself, and there were two days in a row that I overslept work by an hour, and I was this close, if it were not for the mercy of my boss, of losing that job. I would have lost my ability to pay my rent uh, in that case. Uh, is there a point in, in our work, uh, work lives that, uh, that laziness can be a detriment? You better believe it. Is there a point in our spiritual lives where laziness becomes a detriment? You better believe it. Obviously, Priscilla and Priscilla, uh, Aquila and Priscilla did not worship the Isle of Comfort or Leisure. They practiced, uh, they practiced service. They, uh, they made themselves uh, flexible. They had a schedule or they had a lifestyle that allowed them to answer the opportunity that, uh, that uh, Paul gave them to them. And that brings us to our next sub-point here is we don't want to miss an opportunity. We, we talked a little bit yesterday about how, uh, you know, we want to pray for, for God to make opportunities in our lives. But what do we do when that opportunity finally presents itself? Are we able to accept? Do we come up with an excuse as to why we might not be able to do that today or why we might not be able to do that tomorrow or ever? <laughs> uh, we need to look for opportunities in our lives, and that's not just uh, in presenting the gospel. It's not just in evangelism, but it's in all aspects of being a Christian. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 verse 10 tells us, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. Do we, uh, do, when we see an opportunity to do something good for a brother or a sister in Christ, do we take that opportunity? Or do we look for ex excuses why that might not be? Well, I don't, I don't know them that well. That'd be kind of awkward. That's a, that's a common one. That's one I've used in the past. Uh, What's another, what's other excuses we might, that we might use that might keep us from, seek, uh, from answering these opportunities? I just don't have time. And that's what we're talking about here, right? Making yourself available. I don't have time. Why don't you have time? Do you not have time because God doesn't give you uh, time to do things? Or do you not have time because you've made poor priorities? Or... Not necessarily poor priorities, but too many priorities. Have you overloaded your schedule so much that you don't have time for the Lord's work? And doesn't that reflect on where our priorities lie? If, if I'm focusing my schedule around my job or my friends or my, uh, even my family, if that makes me unavailable for the Lord... How many opportunities am I going to miss? How many opportunities am I going to miss to be a positive, uh, uh, a positive uh, force in somebody's life and somebody's relationship with the Lord and in relationship with the church? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 17 tells us, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore... Do not be uh, foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Is the will of the Lord for me to get that promotion at, at work? It could. If that is not getting away with uh, your responsibilities with the Lord. Is the will of the Lord for my own personal gain? or for my own personal happiness, or is the will of the Lord the spreading of the gospel? Is the will of the Lord that no one should be condemned? I think we spend a lot of time wondering what the will of the Lord is, but it's pretty simple. It's for more, uh, more and more souls to be added to the kingdom and to reign in heaven with him. It's not about me. It's about Christ. It's about God. 
And so the question for us is, are we praying about and we're looking for opportunities to serve God? If our schedule is always full, if, it's always, if there's always too much to do, that I can't do something for the Lord, maybe our schedule is not flexible enough. Next thing is that we need to not be too busy to help. Helping is a very important part of being a Christian. There's a lot to do in the Lord's Church, uh, and, and sometimes one person can't do it all, and, and sometimes uh, the willingness to be a helper is the most important thing at any given time. When you look at Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, we read the story of the Good Samaritan. And what was the virtue that the Good Samaritan had over all the other people who didn't take the time to stop and help that Jew on the road. Hmm? He had mercy. He was willing to help. The, 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 uh, let's, let's look at the story. Look at, uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 10, verse 25 and 37. I wasn't sure if I really wanted to spend uh, too much time there, but I, I think it's necessary. Let's look, look at Luke, uh, Luke chapter 10. Verses 25 through 37. Jesus begins uh, reciting the parable in verse 30. A, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and, uh, and, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave, uh, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think? was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves. And they answer, him who showed mercy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. What's the difference between the Good Samaritan and the priest? A priest is, I think, above all members of, uh, of, Jew, uh, of, uh, of Israel. They should have minds of servants, shouldn't they? Uh, the priests themselves, the actual, uh, uh, the ones that would be serving as priests in the tribe of Levi, they had a duty to the temple. They had a duty to perform the works of the people, to perform the, uh, the sacrifices of the people of Israel. It, they lived a life that was in service to uh, the sinful man as well as God, doing his daily work in the temple. And then the other man that's mentioned is a Levite. Now, even, uh, even just a member of the tribe of Levi was expected uh, uh, to have certain responsibilities throughout, uh, throughout Israel. They were of the tribe of priests. And so they would serve uh, 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 year after year uh, in, in the temple doing various, uh, doing various acts. They should have had the mind of a servant, especially for a fellow Jew, but they didn't have the time to stop. They had something more important to do. They were too busy to help. But the Samaritan, he made the time. He didn't think that whatever he was doing was more important than somebody suffering on the road. And we've, when we read that passage in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, I think it's important that the passage says, especially to those of the household of faith, uh, of faith, that doesn't exclude everyone else. Of course, we especially help brothers and sisters, but what about the sinful? What about those outside of the brotherhood? How are we to treat them? Do we look for opportunities to assist our fellow man in their day-to-day -day life? When we see somebody suffering, do we say, mm, somebody else can handle that? Or do we take the opportunity? We have no idea what God has in store for us. We have no idea how God might use us to impact someone's life. Um, we need to know that it is 
our responsibility as Christians to assist the needy. If we consider ourselves religious, but are too busy to help the, those in need, what good is our religion? James chapter 1, verse 27 says what? Pure and undefiled religion is this. Who can finish the rest of that? What's it? That we take care of the needs of widows and orphans. Are we being servants as God calls us to be? Are we just taking care of ourselves? Are we just taking care of our own needs? Or when we see somebody suffering, do we look for an opportunity, or do we take that opportunity to help? Next sub point here that we're going to look at it being available is that we need to not get too attached to people or places. Aquila and Priscilla did a lot of traveling in their day. They met a lot of people. But when the call of the gospel brought them to a new place, they were ready to get up and go. Uh, but this one, that doesn't, I'm, th this is a difficult one to fulfill. Because our families are important to us. Our church families are important to us. Uh, going to, uh, to Carnes uh, for two years, although it's been the most amazing thing of my life so, uh, that I've experienced so far, it was a difficult decision in one aspect because I would be spending two years without my church family. Uh, you know, Palm Beach Lakes has been uh, such an important part of my life and, and uh, helped me through so many aspects of my life. I have a lot of love for people here, but there was a more important call to take on. And I, I'm not using this as an example to glorify myself at all, but, um, but do we allow ourselves sometimes to let family or friends or even our local congregation tie us too tightly down that we don't go where the Lord needs us? Um, look in Mark chapter 1 uh, for just a moment here. Mark chapter 1 verse 37 and 38. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose, I have come forth. In this passage, they have, uh, they've come down to Capernaum. And, and in Capernaum, we find, uh, we find a lot of people who knew Jesus, who heard his word and had obeyed Jesus. He had, done, uh, he had, uh, he had uh, exercised demons. He had healed the sick here. And these people were, uh, uh, fully believed Christ. And, and there would have been such an opportunity for Jesus to get tied down here and spend some time with them ministering to them and that may have been very helpful to those people personally at that particular time but what was more important that that jesus continue that he continue his ministry and those people who are already becoming disciples of christ continue to teach in that area uh, themselves jesus didn't tie, uh, tie himself down too long uh, uh, he traveled about through, uh, throughout Judea, uh, throughout, uh, throughout Samaria, seeking who uh, he might be a minister to uh, and, and didn't allow his uh, emotions uh, to keep him from that mission. Uh, although Jesus certainly valued relationships, he didn't place his existing relationships ahead of his mission and purpose. And so we shouldn't either. Uh, there's, there's going to be a time uh, in your life where you're going to have to make a decision for yourself, for your family, uh, more importantly, for the church. Can I be more, of more use elsewhere? But maybe that's not exactly as applicable to us. Let's put it in, in terms that maybe we would really relate to. 
when we get into cliques within the congregation, do we put that certain group of people above the rest? Uh, a lot of people know how much uh, 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 I've got a bit of a, a crew of friends here, some tightly knit friends here. And we're not, and I'm certainly not going to say that, uh, that we should not have those close friendships because those are some of the most important friendships that you can have in the Lord's Church, those people that you can rely on above all others. But does my dedication to my, those friends supersede my responsibilities to the rest of my brethren? Uh, it absolutely cannot. We have got to make sure that our time is spent not just with a few, but with the whole. This, this congregation here at Palm Beach Lakes, I think, is, is such a wonderful group of people because uh, although we have our close friends, we are always looking out for each other. We're always looking for opportunities how we might help even uh, the least of us, whatever that actually means for, for this congregation. We've got to make sure that we continue doing that. We need to make sure that, that we don't uh, forget the lesser of us. We need to make sure that we don't put our personal friendships too highly above the rest of, of our brethren. Uh, we're going to move on to our second point. And as we move on, we're going we're gonna to go back to the city of Corinth, as I was speaking of uh, earlier. And we want to learn a little bit more about this experience that Priscilla and Aquila had uh, with them. Uh, so turn over to Acts chapter 18 if you, if you're, if you moved away from there. Uh, we're going to look at uh, verses 5 through 17 and, and get to know this, this story a little bit better before we, we move on to our next point. So it's Acts chapter 18, verses 5 through 17. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul had, uh, was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. For now, on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justus, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Gallio was pre-consul, a uh, proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were uh, if, it, if, I, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O oh Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. How would you describe the experience that Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla had in Corinth? It was difficult. Good word. It was difficult. We're going to uh, discuss the difficulties that might arise in being soldiers for Christ. We're gonna find, uh, we find there in verses 5 and 6 that the Jews were not interested in listening to the gospel. They didn't want it. Verse 7, Aquila and Priscilla and Paul, they may have been tempted to want to avoid the synagogues. They may have wanted to, eh, let's, let's stay away from there. It's, it's a bit too dangerous right about now. And besides, they don't want to, they don't want to hear us anyhow. And they may have learned that just the fact of preaching Jesus was, danger, was a bit too dangerous in and of itself. Was there logical reason for them to fear to continue in their work? 
without a doubt. At some point uh, during that time, Paul was no longer in Ephesus. Uh, in that, uh, if we go, continue to verses 24 through 26, it tells us of a, another man. Uh, a certain man by the name of Apollos, born, in Al- born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and a, mighty, uh, a man who is mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John, so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Then, verse 26, take a look at that for me there. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So before we uh, get too far into that, we, uh, it tells us that Aquila and Priscilla heard Apollos. Apollos was speaking in the synagogue. He was preaching. Where were they when they heard him? In the synagogue. Did they allow their fears to keep them from going back to the synagogue? No. They, they knew the dangers involved going to the synagogue, but yet they continued to. They continued to go back. They continued to hear the word of God preached and preach the word of God And in this case, give correction where it was needed. And this is going to bring us to our next point, our next uh, uh, main point here. And where am I on time? I've got four minutes. So this is going to be our final point this evening. But I think this is one that we should really uh, focus on here and understand that being available for God is going to mean that we need focus. We need to focus on the mission. And what does focus require of us? When Apollos spoke in the synagogue, Aquila and Priscilla were present, knowing the dangers involved and who stood in their way, who stood in opposition to them but the Jews. The Jews were seeking how they might ruin them, seeking how they might stop their message. Who are the Jews that, in our, that are in our lives? Who are the people that, might, that we might not want to bring the gospel to? Would, have, would have Quilla and Priscilla and Paul have been not... not uh, righteous by making the decision, but it would be understandable if they didn't necessarily feel like bringing the gospel to the Jews at this particular time. I, I, I think it's understandable, but it would have been wrong. It would have been wrong. Did the Jews, despite their opposition, despite their uh, blatant attacks against the church, did they still deserve to hear the gospel preached? Does every soul in this world deserve to hear the gospel preached? Do we pick and choose who we bring the gospel to? Who are the Jews in your life? Who are the people that have rubbed you the wrong way? Or maybe you got into an argument with, uh, maybe about the Bible, and it just seemed like, ah, they're never going to listen, and you wrote them off. Where are your synagogues in life, in your life? Where are those places where you found too hostile of an environment that, eh, let's just stay away from there. Um, I think I talked about it the other day, it might have been Monday, about my, my poor habit in the past of getting involved in Facebook arguments. And uh, boy, is that a temptation. It is such a temptation to, to want to address somebody right there on their post 
and set them straight about what, they, uh, about what they're talking about. And they come back with a really good zinger that really puts you in your place. And ah, they're, they're never going to pay attention. They're never going op- to listen. And I click ignore on that conversation. And I never go and talk with that person about it uh, more deeply. I write that person off. Deleted their, their name off Facebook. Maybe I even blocked them. And I never have to deal with that person again. They can just go and, and I'll let the devil have his way with them. Where are your synagogues? I think it's interesting that in the case of Apollos, what, how, how did uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila approach Apollos when he was wrong with, about baptism? He took him aside. They took him aside. That's right. Did we all hear that? That uh, Priscilla and Aquila, Julia saying uh, Priscilla and Aquila, they took Apollos aside. Apollos didn't have bad intentions with what he was doing. He was a, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, he was a, at least a disciple of John the Baptist, and, and obeyed the call for uh, uh, to repent from John. But he had not yet fully understood. And and do we sometimes? see like a little flaw in somebody's armor and we latch onto that and see an opportunity to say uh, uh to to go after them rather than doing what uh, uh aquila and priscilla did rather than doing what julie's talking about taking them aside showing them respect obeying matthew chapter 18 that when you have something against a brother you speak to them first in private not in public what good does it do? Or who's going to respond well? And who's going to think that you're well-intentioned in calling them out if it's blasted out there for the whole world to see? How much better is it if we talk with somebody in private and see if we can reach a correct understanding peacefully as brothers or as hopefully soon to be brothers we've got uh, to cut uh, tonight's uh, uh, bible study a little short and well i guess not short it's the the right amount of time but uh <laughs> but i didn't get to every point that i wanted to explore here but i but we need to look at the life of aquila and priscilla and see how they made themselves available In the case of Apollos, how did they make themselves available? They made themselves available by being warm, by being respectful, and by being willing to correct a brother. We need to not only be available for the uh, for the opportunity. We need to not be uh, make sure that we're not too busy in our schedules. We need to make sure that our hearts are available to each other. We need to make sure that our hearts are available to, uh, to the lost. If we're not seeking to help someone reach Christ, are we doing the work of the Lord? We're not. And if we're not approaching people with the heart of Christ, are we doing the work of the Lord? We're not. Let's challenge ourselves to be available. Let's challenge ourselves to be available in our duty, in our, uh, in our spare time, in our, uh, in our priorities, and let's be available in our hearts to bring the lost to Christ and to build up one another in, into good work. Uh, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're, we're so very thankful to you for choosing mere man to be your soldiers of your kingdom father we are so thankful that through the example of jesus christ we know how we might act how we might prioritize our lives and father we pray that 
that if we've had uh, lives that uh, up until this point have not made enough time to be true workers in the kingdom, that we pray that we leave that life behind, that we choose to, to change that today. We pray, Father, that, that when you give us opportunities to serve you and to serve our brothers and sisters and to serve the lost, that we are available to answer that call. Uh, help us to have the right heart and have the right attitude, Father, as we seek to please you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.